Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired, taken care of, and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today we're talking about how to make things better without his conscious effort. I'm going to share five ways to grow your marriage single-handedly. My guest, Sarah, was resentful that her husband was so weak, didn't take initiative, and didn't know how to discipline their children because he didn't have a backbone. She knew he had a lot of issues to work through, but therapy wasn't helping. Then Sarah learned something that changed everything, and today her husband is masculine and attractive. She looks forward to his touch and loves the way he looks at her. She's going to share what she did that brought out all this attractive manliness. And then I'll be giving out the award for the worst relationship advice of the week, which is a recipe for a standoff where you're both stuck, miserable, possibly for years. All that is coming up. But first, let's talk about this fantastic news. The Empowered Wife podcast has reached a big milestone. The show has been downloaded over 100,000 times in less than four months since we launched. I want to congratulate the team who makes it all possible. Kathy, Nicole, Arturo, Monica, Ugo, and thank you for listening, for sharing it with your friends, for being a guest, and for sending me terrible advice that you passed along. Helps me so much. It means so much to me, so I'm grateful, and if I had known how much fun we were going to have doing this, I wouldn't have waited so long to start a podcast. And if I knew it was going to be so crazy popular, well, maybe it's better that I don't know things until I get there. But it is a thrill, and I wanted to celebrate that milestone with you by doing my happy dance right here on this podcast. Happy, happy, happy. All right, now let's talk about how to make things better without his conscious effort. When your relationship is in the doldrums, it's tempting to try to get your husband to do something about it, like read a relationship book or talk to someone that you think could help him or go to marriage counseling. If only he would do that, things would be so much better, right? Well, that was my initial approach, and it didn't help matters at all. And first of all, he wasn't into it. So he was resisting, and then I just pushed even harder for him to learn how to be a better husband. And the subtext of that is, you don't even know how to be a good husband. In fact, you kind of suck at it, which is highly critical. And no surprise, he was highly defensive about it. It turns out the joke was on me, because I was the one with the key to making things amazing. Focusing on his shortcomings and coming up with various ways he could improve never got me anywhere I wanted to go. Fortunately, I found a better way to get the attention, affection, and the special treatment I now enjoy. So here are five ways to grow your marriage without him even knowing what you're doing. Number one is to go on a gratitude kick. Once you're well-rested, you can decide to focus on your husband's good qualities instead of those other ones that seem glaring by making a gratitude list about him. Now, you won't be able to do this if you're frazzled, right? So that's why you need to be well-rested to start out. But then you ask yourself, well, what is it I like about him? Is he funny? Does he work hard? Is he patient? Is he good at fixing things? Athletic? Is he protective? Does he share your values or speak three languages or play the guitar? There was something about that guy that you married that had you choose him. What was it? Aren't you glad you have a husband with all those great traits and talents? Number two is to dwell on your desires. Dwell on your desires. Another thing that contributed to my marriage problems was my complaining habit. I had heard that I shouldn't complain. But that sounded impossible. Like, like stop breathing. Because there were so many things wrong with my marriage and my life. And now I think of complaints as lazy desires. So just figuring out what I want instead of what I don't want helps my husband know how the heck to please me, which means I have a much better chance of getting it. Plus, I'm not the whiny complainer anymore, which was not very attractive to him or to me. Don't miss being around her, the complainer. Number three is feel pretty. Now, maybe you have inner criticism for your appearance, like a lot of women do, but maybe there's also something like putting on your favorite lipstick or a new top or your best fragrance that makes you feel cute. Maybe a manicure does that for you or curling your hair or sleeping with a face mask. Feeling cute 
is the same as feeling confident. And confidence is attractive. So what would make you feel more confident today? Number four, start a smile campaign. And along those lines, smiling not only makes you look better, it also makes you feel better. So if you decide to smile at everyone you see today, every time you see them, it will make you more attractive and happier. Now, what does that have to do with your relationship? Well, only happy people have happy relationships. Did you catch that? I'm going to repeat that one. I just love this. Only happy people have happy relationships. And making yourself happy is the theme of this podcast, as you've probably noticed. So number five is show him that you're happy to see him. This is the outward expression of it. Now that you're feeling so good, how about showing some of your enthusiasm when you see your man? You could tell him how happy you are and maybe even say, oh, I'm happy you're home or great to see you. If it feels awkward or goofy to be so enthusiastic, it may be that you feel vulnerable about being gushy. But you know what? Gushy is endearing. Think about your dog. He's happy every time he sees you, even if you just saw him five minutes ago, right? Isn't that so appealing? Maybe you're not actually happy to see your husband, so it wouldn't be authentic. Or sometimes you are and sometimes you're not, so you'll reserve your enthusiasm for the days when you feel like it, right? But what if it were your policy to be happy to see him because it represented your position that overall, you are so happy to be his wife? It could just take your relationship up an entire big notch or two. So which of these ways will you experiment with to grow your relationship this week? If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. Sarah was resentful that her husband seemed so weak, didn't take any initiative, and didn't know how to discipline their children because he didn't have a backbone. She just wasn't attracted to him because he was so needy emotionally and sexually, and she knew that he had a lot of issues to work out, but therapy didn't seem to be helping. Then Sarah learned something that changed everything, and today her husband is a completely different man, masculine and attractive. She looks forward to his touch, and she loves the way he looks at her. She's going to share how she did that, and she has moved heaven and earth to be with us today during quarantine with her husband and eight children. Sarah, thank you for being on the Empowered Wife Show today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So take us back to the very beginning of how you met your husband, because in some circles, it's an unusual way to meet your spouse. So in our circles, dating is not a conventional dating where, you know, you meet each other and fall in love. Um, dating was um, more like an interview, whether this person, you know, do you share the same values? Can, you know, do, you, do they have character? Um, can you basically do like them? But there's nothing involved really that would foster love and romance before the actual marriage. So how did you initially meet your husband-to-be? So um, a cousin of mine, who happened to be his uh, high, one of his high school teachers, put us together. He did. Okay, so and the first time you met him, it was for this interview, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. So before we met, uh, my parents had done just like any regular interview, you know, reference check and background uh, information and all that, um, and got a rundown of what the person he was and what things he had accomplished and uh, where he was studying and all that. Um, so when all that was in place, we uh, he picked me up and uh, he didn't drive at that time, so he picked me up in a taxi. And uh, until that point, I really had very minimal social contact with men outside my family. I'd gone to an all school and he had done, you know, gone to an all boys school. So um, I was pretty nervous, but I told myself, I'm 18, I can handle this, <laughs> and I'll be just fine. 
Well, lo and behold, um, he opened the car door for me, which was really gracious. And then he opened the other side of the taxi and slid into his seat. And I just lost it. I started to hyperventilating and I, and I literally slid to the bottom of the taxi and pulled my coat over my head. <laughs> just a little nervous, huh? Just a little nervous. And that one hit me totally unexpected. I was not planning to hide under the table like a three-year-old, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> oh, so cute. And then, so then uh, it, it went well between the two of you with the interviewing. And then uh, how did he ask you to marry him? Yeah, so it's interesting that you say it went well. Um, in certain respects, right, it went well. Uh, we shared the same values. I, you know, I saw his character was kind and sensitive. But um, in terms of really relating, enjoying his company, like ease of conversation, that was a struggle for me. That was a real struggle for me. Sounds like it was a little bit of a, a stressful interviewing process. Yeah, it was a little stressful. It was hard for me to trust the process. I mean, I trusted the process, but, but you know, it's scary. You know, I'm a girl like any other and want to be romance and affection. And I, I didn't know how that was going to be with him. And you weren't really getting any of that at this point, it sounds like. You're having to make this decision without any of the... Uh, traditional romantic feelings that we see in movies and books that's that wasn't there for you is that right yeah so okay so how did he ask you to marry him okay so he um didn't really ask me he kind of just told me that he assumed (laughs) he assumed that we were ready to take the next step together and um and I kind of said okay yeah, I was, I was expecting him to ask me that. I was, I was expecting him to, wasn't surprised that he had assumed that we were ready because we had kind of reached the end of our interview process where we basically knew whatever would be relevant to us getting married in our circle. So um, I actually asked him if he could ask me. And he did, he did, which is really nice. He showed up for me that way. Um, but it wasn't so satisfying because I asked him to ask me. And so even though he did it, it didn't feel, didn't feel like you were feeling desired or pursued. Yes, it didn't feel like I was being pursued, right? Yeah. So you proceeded, you got married, and then some... Trouble started, it sounds like. So what what was happening? So my husband actually has a really romantic nature. And um, he, um, you know, he did all sorts of lovely things for me. But, um, you know, it's, it's crazy when I look back at how I received him. I really, um, I really didn't receive it well. My parents were supporting us at that point because he was still studying. So, you know, and he would buy me flowers or want to take me out. Or I always had this little voice in the back of my head saying, well, that's irresponsible, you know. Um, or we, we should be more careful with our money. And my parents weren't answering us at all. So there wasn't anything from, you know, from their end. But um, in my head, I really built this picture of him as, you know, um, not so responsible. Yeah, so you were trying to keep the budget down uh, and he was trying to romance you. And so you were rejecting that really just out of concern for your parents' finances, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. And then what about after you had babies? So it's interesting because I had, you know, we, we had started having children right away. and. Um, I just remember, you know, my mother came to help me have the baby. I had the baby at home. It was was beautiful. But I was still very, very young. (laughs) I didn't connect to being a mother. You know, actually, when I I met with the midwives the first time, they had me fill out my information. And, you know, on the form, I said mother's name and mother's 
a maiden name and, you know, date of birth. And I called my mother and a social. I said, Ma, what's your, you know, what's your date of birth? What's the year you were born? What's your social? She's like, honey, why do you need all this information? She said, look, it says right here. <laughs> oh, I love it. And you're like, no, no, I'm the mom now. So, but yeah, I may, I get it. You were like probably 19 years old at this time. Yeah. Right, you're still a baby yourself. So, okay, so and that well, was a big one. That was a big one. Having my first baby, and my mother was there with me. Um, and she's wonderful, and she took care of the baby that first week. You know, I didn't think I even changed the diaper. And then she had to go home, so she left. And it was that first moment where we're on our own with this baby, completely responsible. And I just buckled down and I took that baby and I, I, you know, he needed a diaper change and I told my husband, okay, you know, can you please, yeah, like I started ordering him, like, okay, we need to change his diaper. Can you please get the diaper? And I like, I just stepped into that role of like, I've got to take care of this baby. Um, and I just was surprised that he was a little, ta-da. <laughs> you were just focused on this is what's got to get done. And it sounds like you decided to just kind of take charge and tell him what that yeah. you done. Yeah. And it, you know, and we had, we had sweet moments, um, but we also had moments that really um, built up this vision of him as not being responsible. Like the first time I gave him a bath, um, and my husband wanted to come and, you know, he was going to also give him a bath one time and, and he dropped the baby in the water and I had to, um, you know, I fished him out of the water and he was fluttering and, and, and that was it. I mean, that was the last time my husband attempted to bathe a baby. So, you know, in my head, I had this built up, you know, the story built up that my husband really didn't know how to handle kids. Not that I knew more, but I had some more experience, maybe some more instinct. It was sealed. Right. And mama instinct is, it's pretty strong, right. In terms of protecting your baby. I think, I think that's a pretty normal part of being a mom. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah. 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 A lot of, um, you know, they're so tiny and helpless. And they are super vulnerable. And you just went through this ordeal with them for nine months and then the birth process. So, so you decided that you were going to do a better job protecting those babies than he would, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. And I collected evidence, you know, throughout the years as the children kept on coming, you know, um, buckling the babies, like he wouldn't buckle the baby, he wouldn't buckle them in their car seats properly or at all. And uh, brushing the teeth was not on the, not on the agenda and. You know, I knew about healthy food and nutrition and the routines that they needed to be calm and just um, really snowballed. So um, you, you talk about a point, one point when you had, I think, was it five children and you are really responsible for everything. Tell, tell us how, about how that was going. So, um, you know, when they were little, one, two, three, the amount of children, I mean, and, and their ages were little. It, it was easy to um, it was easy to have this illusion of control. Like I was running things very well, you know. There was number four and then number five. I just was exhausted. I was exhausted. I was lonely and resentful. Um, you know, my husband uh, would help. He did not help clean up at all. He would help with the kids. Uh, you know, he would do like an activity with them. He would take them out or something. But I always felt a backlash from that. He would be upset at me for having to be with the kids for so long or, you know, an hour or two. And I'm thinking, you know, this is nothing, right? I'm with them 24-7 mostly. And you took him for an hour. And what's the big deal? And he, so he seemed to put out about that. Yeah, yeah. He seemed to put on about that. Um, and wake feedings at night. Um, I would mostly, I would get up with them. I, you know, I nursed and full time. So, so that was all intense. That was all intense. Yeah. So, Sarah, your husband is pretty prominent and well loved in the community, isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, he's a really um, great teacher and, uh, you know, not only a teacher in the classroom, but a teacher in the community. And um, I mean, mothers were constantly coming up to me and just gushing at what a difference my husband had made for their son and how much their son just loved his class and loved him. And, um, you know, they tell me these wonderful stories of ways he'd been you know, really thoughtful and uh, incredible. And, and of course, they would gush to me at how lucky I am. And uh, and I would just be thinking inside, you know, gosh, if only you knew. This was not the way you were showing up for me at home. And you kind of had a breakdown at one point about that. Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. Well, one night I was in the kitchen cleaning up again and my husband was sleeping already and it was after a long evening of, you know, bedtime and supper and bedtime and um, I was also teaching at that point, so teaching the high school classes and it was just a long, exhausting evening behind me and a long, exhausting evening ahead of me as I tried to clean up. And uh, I just lost it. I grabbed those uh, those top grapes and I started rattling them and smashing them together and just howled at the top of my lungs. Yeah. And did, did he then get up and start helping you or what happened? Um, I think I managed to wake him up and he came downstairs and asked me what was going on. Um, I don't think he helped me clean up, but I think at that point we decided to start going to therapy. Okay. All right. So tell me about that. So you're real, you're realizing like we have issues in this marriage. This is not, we can't go on like this. Yeah. We decided to try some things to fix it. So tell me about that. Yeah. So, um, we went to therapy. Oh my gosh. We tried so many therapies made things a whole lot worse. Um, you know, bringing up past issues, finding past issues. And at a certain point, it was just like, who would want to be married to somebody with so many issues? Um, so that was really, um, you know, it just further broke down my respect for my husband. Um, and then we, we did find, we eventually found the therapist who was more comfortable but the whole model of the therapy was communication. Communication is the key to a good marriage. And really, what are we communicating hurts? So we got really good at it. You know, my husband was sincere. He really, really wanted to be a good husband. And he would listen to me and he would reflect many times. Many times he would and he would just get resentful himself. But even the times where he would listen to me and it would feel good that he was listening, we still lost out intimacy because, you know, how many times can someone be criticized and still want to... Didn't make him want to come in for a hug and a kiss or didn't make him want to snuggle with you or hold hands or make you laugh or any of that. Huh? Yeah, none of that. So our relationship became really heavy. Even when we were, you know, functioning and I wasn't rounding so great and howling, Things were still very heavy. So not a lot of fun or lightness. No, not a lot of fun or lightness. And so so around the time you had five kids, uh, you decided to take a break from that. Yeah. Having large families one of our dreams. So really putting a stop to it was uh, was, was a real statement between ourselves and also in our in our circles. So people in your circle were noticing that you stopped. Yeah. And people would say, so how old's your youngest? And I'd say, you know, four. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so you, and you felt some pressure, it sounds like then to. I did feel pressure. So it's like a little bit of an embarrassment in a way. Was it kind of a throwing up a flag for your community that all was not well at your house. Is that? Yeah, yeah, there was a little flag there. And there was also internal pressure because, um, you know, 
one of our values is raising children, is bringing these little souls into the world. So to stop from that felt like I was, you know, aborting my power to create more life. So it felt like really deep. You're giving up uh, an important purpose. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a lot of stress. So, uh, so what happened? So um, we decided to continue having children, and uh, I conceived, and we had twins. <laughs> so that was an intense uh, adjustment. Um, it was very exciting. My kids were all excited, you know. But as far as myself as a mother went, um, it was it was a huge, heavy load to carry overwhelming you've already got five and now you unexpectedly you get two more yeah uh, probably not anticipating that thinking you're just going to get one more but then you get two more mm-hmm. so the overwhelm was already big and now there's even more stress on you yeah how did you get out of this one sarah okay so um actually i was at a lecture from uh, Wilma Rally in the community, and he mentioned your book, Surrendered Life. So when I came home, I mentioned it to my husband. Um, he had recommended your book, and uh, he went out and bought it for me. So oh. this was actually a few years before my twins, and I hadn't related to it at all. But somehow, after they were born, I was really searching again. I knew I didn't want to go back to therapy. We had really closed that door. Um, you know, we had accomplished everything that the therapy had set out to teach us, really. And the therapist himself told us, you're done. Like, you communicate very well. Like, I have nothing more to, to teach you. But that door was closed. It didn't, didn't get up to that ease and delight and joy and connection that I really wanted. So I, uh, I was speaking to a friend. And uh, she was telling me some things in her relationship, and it sounded familiar. I remember those concepts from your book. So I asked her, does it have to do with a surrendered life? And she told me, yes. She said, I suggest that you really study that book and really get to know it well. So, you know, I, I looked you up online because I, I knew that I had read that book already, and I couldn't really, I couldn't really relate to it so much. So I, I just... I Googled you and called for, you know, ask for coaching. So you called for coaching. What was the first thing you started doing differently in your marriage? So the first thing that changed for me was, was not a conscious thing that I did different yet, but it was more like the confusion cleared. And I think that was huge because even if I had, I've had light moments before and, you know, my husband and I didn't fight, didn't have big fights. But now that I knew I had this pack, like a lightness bubbled up. I really like, you know, and um, I remember that turning point where my husband, I was, I don't know, making lunch or something. And my husband kept walking by me and stopping and coming a little closer. And then he, you know, kind of go back to do his thing, and then he just kept coming back. And he said, "You know, after a while, I was like, what's going on?" So he says to me, "What did you do to yourself? You're magnetic." <laughs> so I, I think, I guess that must have been self care, where I'm starting to, you know, open up, um, open up things that I enjoyed. I mean, the coaching just put that sparkle in me. He found you irresistible. He found me irresistible. And so some of the tension in your marriage started to lift, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I also, you know, I started noticing, I'm noticing good things about him and taking notes and letting him know that I saw and trusting him more. Until then, I hadn't really trusted him as a father. Um, I hadn't really seen him um you know, give them a secure presence um, and really, and my kids were, had been really struggling, I felt, because of that. You know, some kids were struggling in school, some academically, some with respect to their teachers, and um, I really was seeing this 
lack of discipline all over the place. Um, and I was, I was completely stretched to my mat. So I wasn't doing a great job picking up the tab there either. So um, that was a huge, huge piece to start trusting him to um, step up and be there for our kids. How did he do? So um, it was a process. It was a process. I had to, it, you know, it took a few months of really feeling like I was walking off a cliff into thin air. I, I did not know what was going to happen. I really didn't know. And I had, remember, from all these years of therapy, I had all these theories and stories about his abilities because of his, you know, childhood and his father dying young and not having a father figure and therefore not knowing how to do this job. And, you know, it was just, I had this huge, um, I had this huge uh, story about him that was really taking up a lot of space for us. So uh, many times if things were getting heated in the house, um, I would step out for a little walk, take a breather, and let my husband handle it. And uh, I would walk around the block until I was able to pack my house and didn't hear anything. <laughs> and then I would step back in and say, thank you for handling that. Wow. So this must have taken tremendous courage for you to do tremendous that. Tremendous courage, yes. And if he was, you know, if he was uh, handling a child and I felt things were going wrong, it used to be I would step into the room and say, just my presence so that things wouldn't get out of hand, or I would tell him, it's okay, I'll, I'll take over from here. You know, all of that was very kind and helpful, I thought, but was very controlling, obviously, and non-trusting. So I stopped doing that. I just, just kept on staying out of the way. Wow. Wow. And so, and how did he respond to all these changes you were making? So, um, yeah, so he, he started taking initiative and um, it was really beautiful. I remember one day the principal was calling us for another meeting in school and I just couldn't take her anymore. So I told my husband how overwhelmed I was and he said, okay, I'll take care of it. And I had that struggle inside myself, you know, what if he says the wrong thing? What if they're going to think, where's the mother? You know, he's going to take off work, that he can meet the school and I'm home. It's just the whole thing. I was, I was afraid how he would come across, how he would represent their children. But I let him do it. I trusted him. And it was amazing. It was amazing. He came home. He said, that was a great meeting. And you know, our kids started to get the support they needed um, and they started to grow. They really started to change. Wow. So you actually saw better results. It sounds like. Oh, oh, yeah, totally. Wow. And this must have been a huge relief. Huge relief for me. Really huge. And it just, it really spread to every area where, you know, he started bringing me the babies that night, right, to nurse. Instead of, and he told me, wake me up, right? And and if I didn't wake him up, he would say, he would like, he would be upset. He wanted to give me that. He wanted me to stay in bed. So even if I have to get up to nurse them, he didn't want me to get out of my bed. So um, he would get up and bring me the babies and, and he would be complimenting me, what a wonderful mother I am. And so he's doing twice the work and appreciating me that much more. What a difference. Yeah. Feeling so, so, so you're feeling a lot less overwhelmed. This is with the twins. Yeah. Wow. And so, how did this change your view of your fulfilling on your dream to have a big family when he started come, showing up in these ways? Uh, it was definitely a game changer. It was totally a game changer. And what was so beautiful is that, you know, he um, actually, after our twins, were about two weeks, he told me that he wanted to have another baby with me, which is very different because until then we had kind of like the way we got engaged, just assumed we're going to keep on having babies. And here he told me, um, I want to have a baby with you. And he was so much more involved. He didn't have to say, uh, why don't you tell me you want to have another baby? Like you said when you got engaged, right? right. So, 
So was there a turning point after you started using the skills and the connection framework? Yeah, I was um, really um, staying out of my husband's way and letting him figure himself out with the kids and really uh, not correcting him or pointing out his mistakes or telling him what I thought best what to do. And and then one day my husband just came over to me and he put his hands on his, my shoulders and he told me, I hate what you're doing. And I was shocked. I was really shocked. So I kind of looked at him and he said, because I'm faced with all my own shortcomings. And really, until that point, you know, he hadn't been able to hear his own voice. And it was really when I stepped back and um, stopped being down, breathing down his neck all the time, that he was able to take stock of who he wanted to be and how he wanted to show up as a father. Did you feel in that moment, did you feel so vindicated? Like, is, it was almost like getting an apology, right? There was so much accountability in him saying that. Yeah. It must have felt great. It felt really great. And it also felt, you know, when someone takes accountability for themselves, and I know this for myself as well, um, when I take full accountability for myself, you know, it just made me want to see all the ways where he was already being a good father, you know? It, it just made that so much easier. It made you want to be on his side for what a good dad he is. What a good father. Uh, I love that. That is an amazing story. My husband is now able to make a difference for, for myself, for our children in a completely different way. You know, he's been able to pinpoint and see, really relate to our children in ways where I, I wasn't able to, you know, as a father and a mother, we have different strengths. And I just, I love that he, um, he has vision, vision and leadership. And um, with each child, he's been able to bring out something special and really give them a gift. You know, one child, it was music. And when this child wanted to do music, uh, he wanted a really expensive keyboard. And, and I thought, you know, I played music as a kid. I tried teaching him, and he didn't really show much uh, talent. And I thought, you know, why why invest so much money in this child? His music, let's, let's wait a little bit. Let him prove himself that he can practice and he can be disciplined about it. And, and then we'll get him an instrument. And my husband said, no, getting him this instrument is showing him that we care. And uh, it actually became a really special point of connection between myself and my son because I'm the musical one. My husband is not. And uh, I got to play with him. And, you know, we share songs all the time. And now he's doing great. And he plays at events. And he, you know, he really, he really flew with it. Wow. What a story. That's amazing. I love that. Just one kid, you know, each kid with something else. I have two of my little ones, a boy and a girl, um, like eight and nine years old, and he just got into their world and their love of little critters. <laughs> so they're always out there hiking in the rain and finding salamanders and bringing home frogs and catching fish with, you know, like a string and a worm and, you know, like with their hands. Just, it's just, it's hysterical. I find it. And they love it. And we have chickens. And this is all my husband's initiative to get my children, you know, just develop their love of features and taking care of these little critters. And Is this the guy with no backbone that I heard about earlier? No, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And it's interesting because um, I was always fixated on, you know, obviously I wanted our children to develop responsibility and I was fixated on um, chores being the medium for developing responsibility in a household and, um, and my husband was not into that. And this was one thing where I, I learned how to respect, respect that, that he does not think that chores is a way to teach me responsibility and really 
see the ways that he was teaching our top children responsibilities, you know, and then just honoring my desire for a clean house, right? Letting go of that piece and, and him getting me uh, cleaning help, really accepting that from him um, and thanking him for both pieces, teaching my children, teaching our children responsibility and supporting me with having a clean house. And, um, you know, it took a few years, but eventually he's now the one telling our kids to do chores and he cleans up all the time. And it's such a, it's a switchover, you know, it was a real, it was a real switchover, really respecting his idea, you know, not trying to explain to him why chores is more important, but just giving that time and space and trust that it'll come when it does. And, and now it shows, you know, now it's showing up in my life. That is great. That's, I think, what every mom dreams of, right? It's the house is clean and their kids are learning responsibility and it's, and you're not having to nag them and repeat and tell them to keep cleaning. Well, disclaimer, my house is not clean. <laughs> I don't think it can be, <laughs> relatively. Yeah, yeah. So what would you say to your yourself like if you could go back and, and say what you know now and tell yourself back then, what would you say? Two answers for that a little bit, I think. Um, one would be, I don't know. I don't know if I would have been ready to hear it until I was ready. If I was ready to hear it, I think I would tell myself that, you know, I, I really didn't know who my husband was and what he was capable of until I started really respecting him. And I think that um, had I known that this vision, this view I had of him was a product of, uh, you know, my disrespect and not allowing him to really step into his role as masculinity, um, that would have changed things. Wow. And what's a tip for someone who's listening, who's also feeling overwhelmed as a mother and wishing her husband would step up, what, what suggestions, what, where should she start? Uh, well, I would definitely have her start with getting some coaching. You know, I was not able to see my blind spots until I had someone who was, you know, caring, compassionate, and also knew what they were looking for to show me. Well, I love that. Well, this is, um, these are very personal things that we're talking about today. Very private things, really. Um, so what has you been willing to share all this with us? <sighs> you know, if what I can share will strike a chord with another woman, um, so that she'll know that she's not alone and her relationship, not only not hopeless, but there is so much potential that she can access. Um, I think that would be worth it. That would be worth it. And it's interesting because I actually asked my husband about sharing about him. And, uh, you know, it's got to be a little vulnerable for a guy <laughs> that was like talking about him in front of how many thousands of women. Um, and he was so for it. He was so for it. Wow. He's seen the changes in me. And he, he just told me, you can say whatever you want about me as long as it leads to another woman, another marriage, another family reaching happiness. Sarah, I'm so moved by that. I'm, tell him thank you for me because that is very, it is very vulnerable. He's very courageous as well to share about that. And his uh, caring heart really comes through in that. Yeah. What is your relationship like now? It's full of love. It's so different. It's hard to explain in a nutshell, but I really have a man that I can respect, that I do respect. Yeah. And has he become more attractive? Yeah. So all of this really changed how he appeared to me. You know, like a, a weak, moody man is not so attractive. No. Whereas now he's, you know, he comes across strong. The way he approaches me is just with a completely different um, strength to him. 
and uh, it really it's really exciting. And, and so now you are also a coach. You studied to become a coach, and you certified, and you help other women with their marriage. You've even, yeah, you've, you've helped lots of women with their relationships. And how does that impact your marriage? So um, I'll use my husband's words again, because he is making it possible for me to speak to women during this quarantine time. Um, and he tells me, you know, a few times I told him, oh, I, I just can't speak to another woman today. And he said to me, you know, you must. <laughs> He's like, you come back from your session glowing. So you got to go and speak to her. <laughs> <laughs> so he likes when I'm happy and this just makes a difference. So I just feel very empowered. It keeps me accountable and it keeps me, you know, spreading the spreading this, this gift of, of helping women really tap into their feminine core. Beautiful. Well, yeah, there's a reason you're such a powerful coach. I think you inspire a lot of women. It sounds like you get inspired yourself from talking to them too. So I love that. So Sarah, this has been, I'm inspired now. I'm feeling full, full and filled up from hearing your wonderful story. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. And now it's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. And the advice that's got me fit to be tied this week is that a man has to earn his wife's respect before she gives it. A listener heard this one and she sent it to me for consideration for this award, which I love. Thanks for sending me this truly terrible advice, which can only result in a painful standoff. If you're waiting for someone else to go first, you could be waiting a long time, right? One powerful way to look at this is by reversing it and saying, a wife has to earn her husband's love. It sounds pretty harsh that way, doesn't it? I think it's downright offensive, actually. I want my husband to love me just for who I am and how I am. And the idea of having to earn his love is both scary and disheartening. It's lonely. I wouldn't like it at all. And yet I've definitely felt like my husband wasn't earning my respect. What a big hypocrite I was, right? Right, I was. I was also a very lonely hypocrite waiting for him to earn my respect. And the truth is, I just wasn't very good at trusting. I hadn't cultivated that particular skill. And now that I've worked on that some, it's one of my favorite skills. It feels like I have a superpower, actually, to be able to trust and respect even when I feel afraid or even when I see a flawed human being. I didn't realize that respect is actually a decision just like love. They're both action words, actions you decide to take, like going to the store, washing the car, watching your favorite show. You choose them. You love someone because you decide to love them. You respect him for the same reason. That's what we're doing when we fall in love and get married. And by deciding to respect him again, what you're actually doing is standing for his greatness again. You're looking for his best qualities and focusing on your faith instead of your fear. And since people tend to rise to your expectations, you have the power to bring out his best qualities just by deciding to respect him. But even better for me was the part where I stopped feeling hairy and dirty because I was always questioning him or telling him what to do because I didn't respect him. Becoming a respectful wife and woman restored my dignity. And now that I know how good that feels, 
I wouldn't trade it for anything. Learning how to be respectful was a big part of becoming my best self. And my best self is sure a lot more attractive than the shrew with her arms crossed. It's not who I want to be. And for that reason, the advice that a man has to earn his wife's respect before she gives it is the worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Thanks again for sending in that terrible relationship advice. If you hear bad relationship advice and send it to me, you too can have an anonymous shout out on my show. We're just big on privacy around here, so I won't use your name, but I will thank you for sending it in. Thank you. Thank you. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next, I'll share what to do when your husband cheats. That's coming up next week. I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that sometimes I forget that my husband, John, has been dressing himself since before I was born. 